is my 1983 Yamaha Virago XV750. So I started this project like two years ago um, and I haven't touched it in over a year now. But since then I've moved into a much nicer shop. So I'm gonna catch up on all the stuff that I had done previously. And I'm also gonna get the engine running again. So before I had tore the whole bike down, cleaned, power washed and sanded the engine so that I could paint it. And since then, besides put a little oil in the cylinders, I really haven't run it. It's a little dusty from storage, so I'm gonna get it wiped down and then we'll catch up to where we are right now. This project starts the same way that pretty much all my projects start, which is me taking something that's perfectly good and taking it all apart. This bike didn't run great when I got it, but it did run. and it only took a little bit of fiddling to really get it where it would run and ride. I must shred. There's nothing real remarkable about taking a bike apart. You know, you're really just unbolting stuff. Uh, I did keep some of the good stuff, like the exhaust, the battery, uh, all the electrical, which I kept for reference. But really, I just taken it apart. I'm not planning on reusing a lot of it. So the side stands, the foot rests, the center stand, the seat, all that stuff is really just coming apart. So to get the rear separating off, I had to pull all these wires out. And it's, I've never regretted labeling too many things. So I went through and I labeled them all. And if I knew what they did, I labeled them starter or lights or whatever. If I didn't know what they did necessarily, I just put a number. I label both sides with a 10 or a two or an eight. And that means when I go to put it back together, even though I probably won't use all this, I can just put 10 to 10, eight to eight, and it'll work. I labeled the relays. Um, I also took a couple pictures. And no matter what it was, I labeled it all. Right. Got all that wiring loose. Nice. Cool. I got all that wiring loose. There's just two more bolts. And I got the step frame off. After the rear is apart, I go to take the front apart. I got to pull the grips, the controls, the bars, all that stuff comes right off as you would expect. I take everything apart and figure to get a shot. What's going on inside the headlight? It's pretty commonplace to hide everything. Pull the headlight out and there's all kinds of good stuff. I'll have to label and undo pretty much all of that. Pull it out to get the bucket off. Then you can see the fuse box. It's hidden behind the neat little Yamaha logo. It's the fuse box. So we got all that disconnected and labeled. Um, the gauges, headlight signals, all that wiring can be removed. Uh, pulled the front brake off with the lever and the master cylinder. And then finally the front forks can come out.
And finally, the triples and the stem. Upper triple. All right, I got the lower triple and the stem out. And as you can see, the bearings on the lower and the upper aren't in a cage or anything, so I lost a couple. Be careful, if you're taking one of these apart, be careful. Here's a later model. This is from an R6. And they got the bearings in a cage so that they don't fly out. So new technology versus old, I guess. And this is uh, what I'll be making a custom stem for and putting on the Virago. All right, I got the carbs off. You can kind of see they're starting to oxidize, so I'm gonna clean all that up. So this is one of the two, and I've actually already done the second one, so um, they're not terrible. It's not the worst, but uh, basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to take this apart. Uh, I'm going to sandblast some of the components that have a little more corrosion than others. And then I'm going to put everything in the ultrasonic parts cleaner to get all the, everything perfectly clean and brand new. And then I have a nice rebuild kit here that I will be using when I rebuild the carburetor. So Rebuilding a carburetor really isn't that difficult as long as you're organized and you're kind of paying attention to what you're doing. So here I'm really just disassembling it. When I'm reassembling it, I'll explain some of the more important parts. So before that, everything gets a brushy brushy to knock most of the surface dirt off, kind of loosen everything up, and then I'm gonna put it in the ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, I use purple stuff, which can be pretty hard on aluminum, harder than simple green, so I dilute it pretty heavily. And this parts washer is heated, so I always use that. It seems to do a better job. Uh, and then I really don't go anywhere. I keep an eye on everything. And, and then really as soon as it seems like the water has taken all the dirt that it can, I usually pull the parts out and give them a rinse. All right, I got the hat and the bowl out. They're looking pretty good after a sandblast. wash the body of the carb looks amazing came out really well considering I just spent a couple of minutes in there so after everything came out I gave it all a wipe down I, I sloshed it around in some clean water and then uh, I wiped everything down and then I sprayed more carb cleaner in any of the orifices just to make sure there wasn't anything left in there now I'm gonna put this guy back together with all the new parts in the rebuild kit um, one thing I don't think I mentioned earlier bowl drain screw. Uh, I left the old one in knowing that I was going to sandblast it and I didn't want those threads to get all gunked up and I knew there was a replacement but after that got sandblasted and before I put it in the cleaner I took that out. So I'm going to put the new drain screw in the bowl and before I can put the bowl on I got to need to put everything back in. Okay so there are two jets. It's probably impossible to see so it's probably very difficult to see on camera, but one has a much larger orifice than the other. The larger orifice is the main jet, and it will go in the nozzle tube. That is this tube. So this is the main jet. The diaphragm needle goes down in here, plugs the jet, and then when there's vacuum from opening the throttle, this lifts out and allows more fuel to flow through it. So the jet, um, is threaded and it goes in the threaded end, so the threaded end needs to go down and into the bowl area. Hold that with a finger. All right, you can hold that in there with one finger. Uh, there is a washer for the jet. And then the main jet goes in. Snug that bad boy down. Doesn't need to be crazy tight. The secondary jet Threads in, again, not crazy tight. It's brass and aluminum. And then the needle and seat. So the needle and seat assembly. And again, like everything, doesn't need to be super tight. So you just hook the needle onto the float bowl. 
drop it down into the hole in the seat, pin it in place. Okay, just like that. As the float moves, it'll lift the needle out of the seat and let more fuel in. As it gets full, it'll push the needle up. Now the gasket and the bowl can go on. I've already put the drain screw back in. So now I'm gonna do the choke or the start plunger. So the start plunger is a sprung assembly. It again has a rubber needle that goes into a seat. And always not too tight. Just bottom it out. Okay. Now I'll put the diaphragm in. So real careful with this guy. There's a small notch in the casting and the diaphragm has a matching piece. The large spring Whoa. and the hat. Just like that. Can screw the throttle stop in. Okay. And we are back to the future, or the present. So what does it take to just bare bones get an engine like this running? So the first thing you need is air and fuel. And the air is kind of all around us all the time. Whoa. And before I had cleaned the carburetors, so they should be providing the fuel with the air. That should all be taken care of. So you need compression, which for now I'm just gonna assume that I still have. That's kind of the whole point of testing this is just to see, make sure the engine's still in fine condition. But it didn't run great when I first got it, but it did run and ride. So I'm kind of assuming that everything's still good. And finally, you also need spark. So for spark, I'm gonna replace the old coils with a new dual coil, and I wanna temporarily mount that. And the reason I wanna do that is because I'm gonna make new spark plug wires for this, and I want the coil in its about final location because when I cut and crimp the wires, I don't wanna to have to redo them. So I need the coil about where it's gonna go, so I'm gonna start by temporarily mounting that. This is the coil I'm gonna use. It's an Ultima, part number 53-434. And these wires from Taylor, uh, 135 degree ends on them that will have to be cut and crimped, but they're nice and long for a motorcycle. I want the coil, obviously the plugs to face backwards. I'm gonna tuck the coil in here as tight as I can. So I think I'm gonna make a piece that goes between these two. And then with a piece that sticks up, to mount the coil just like that. And then the spark plug wires will come kind of under the tank and directly in be about the most direct route I can get. Oops, that's right. If you want the center to center of two holes, Instead of trying to eyeball it, it's a lot easier to take the outside. Call that two, 240. And then the inside, call it one, 700. The average of those two is your center to center. Or obviously, you can do your outside, two, 240, call it two, 250. And then subtract the diameter of one hole, 250. fits here, and this, this guy fits right here, which means this guy will fit here. And I'll make a second one. One more, like that.
with a little more grinding, I got it to fit with all the bolts in. Um, it's kind of a prototype hanger, but at least it seems like that'll work. At least for a first startup, that'll work. Oh, and another thing you don't really need, but I'm gonna do is, I've already got the exhaust up here. Uh, for some other dimensions, I'm gonna make a new exhaust for it eventually. So I'm gonna put that exhaust on, uh, just because it's a little healthier for the engine to run with an exhaust on than with it out open to the atmosphere. This may be how this exhaust was designed or however the previous owner did it, but with this specific exhaust, they used the stock portion of the exhaust for the rear cylinder. And I think they did that because to get that part in and out, you have to take the rear wheel off, which isn't a huge pain, but it's not great. Besides that, there's nothing really special about putting the exhaust on. So I got that bolted on. So making your own spark plug wire. These wires come with the, the boot for the spark plug already on the end. And I cut it to the length I need. Put the boot on first. If you forget, it's much harder to get over the crimped end. This is a single crimp style. The part here on the bottom will go inside the coil. It's expanded, so it goes inside the coil. And this part will crimp over the end of the spark plug wire. So you want to strip back some of the insulation. That's the conductor. And what you do is you fold it back and then when you put the crimp end over, it holds that conductor down. And then the conductor is always touching the crimped end, which is then touching inside the coil. And then to crimp it, they make pliers, but this goes in the vise. Uh, it's an MSD part. And basically you put the crimp in there and when you squeeze it down in the vise, it crimps it on the wire. Like I spun in there a little, so not the best crimp I've ever done, but it's crimped. You can see the conductor sticking out the back. I had it a little longer than I should have. But it's gonna work just fine. So we know this end fits over the spark plug because it's a factory end and I tested it. But if you look at this end here, it slides right into the coil and it kinda pops in and then I can push the boot down to cover it. So we made a couple temporary wires. This one has two female ends that will plug into the two coil control sockets. So if we look at the drawing, there's your two coils. You can see their positive is just connected. That's the power wire. And then I also made a white and a yellow that are the control wire that will go to the negative on the coil uh, from the respective coil control socket. Here's my janky setup. Um, if you want to get the starter to turn over, all you have to do is put 12 volts to the starter uh, and then also ground whatever is supplying your 12 volts. So I have this rigged up. The wire from the starter goes to the relay, which goes directly to the battery. And I'm grounded to the footrest, which is screwed into the engine and the frame. So it's turning over real fast because I got the plugs out. I squirted some oil in there. So now I'm gonna troubleshoot or see if maybe I am lucky and I have spark. Um, I tried to kind of hot wire the TCM. That's this thing. It picks up signal here from the stator, I guess is what it's called, that spins. And then out here it creates and collapses or it creates and turns off 12 volts. And then the coil that I prototype mounted in the frame uses the collapsing magnetic field caused by the turning off 12 volts to give you spark. So I think I have it wired right, we're gonna find out. All right, I'm not sure you're gonna be able to see it. We're gonna try. But I have spark. And that took forever. That took like two hours to figure out. Um, and it's because this relay is the side stand relay and it is normally closed uh, so I was sending some of the wrong signals to the TCI but uh, I got it fixed and now I have spark and that's how you spend three hours and I've got my gas can 
I got my fuel tank, my Gatorade fuel tank rigged up to a little nylon T for both carbs, and uh, let's see if she'll start. All right, it's definitely not getting gas. I'm gonna try cheating a little bit of gas into it. So we definitely aren't getting enough fuel. Um, I can't smell it after cranking this thing forever. And I can pour a little bit of gas into the carburetor intake and it just immediately fires up. So I know fuel is my problem. So what I did is I pulled the carburetors off and the first thing that I checked that I haven't checked since I rebuilt them was the float level. And it turns out there was basically no fuel in the bowls. They were like half and they're supposed to be 99% full. So what happens when you don't have enough fuel in the bowl is the engine is sucking with a certain amount of vacuum and if there's not enough fuel in the bowl, it just can't pull the fuel high enough to get enough into the engine. So I'm gonna adjust the float bowl level. I think that's the problem. I'm really not sure how it is so bad when it ran before and I didn't change any of that in the rebuild, but whatever, I'm just gonna fix it and hopefully that fixes the problem and this thing will run. All right, so I know I'm not getting fuel through the pilot jet circuit. So I took the carburetors off and I'm gonna kind of show you what the pilot jet circuit is and then why I think it's not working. So this is the pilot jet. It's a little bitty tiny guy. This one's a 41. The fuel level will be somewhere much higher than this pilot jet and take this upside down. So there will be fuel that will want to flow through that and then it ends up getting sucked over into this channel here. This is outside of the bowl so you can see it here. And you can adjust, and you can adjust this little needle that goes in there that allows more or less of that fuel to flow. So I had had this adjusted on both carbs from all the way in to over six turns out, which is a lot, and still wasn't getting enough fuel to start. So I'm gonna put this in and spray some carb cleaner in here and try and figure out if this is the wrong piece, it's from a cheap rebuild kit or what my adjustment maybe should be to even allow anything to flow out of the hole, and then we'll go from there. So I'm checking the float level in the carb that controls how much gas is in the bowl down here. I think the reason I wasn't getting gas before into the engine is because this was way too low, and if it's too low, it requires more effort for the engine to pull the fuel out, and the engine just wasn't doing it. So what you do, this is connected to the drain, and it'll level off once it's totally full. So you just fill it with gas through the fill. And then I still have air in this tube, which is bad. I need to know the fuel level, so I need it all fuel. So what you can do is blow in the vent of the carburetor and kind of pressurize it and push a lot of that air out. And now everything has kind of settled. You see there's no, it's not pulling in a bunch more fuel. And this isn't moving. And this is pretty much exactly what you want. I want on this specific carburetor, the fuel level is about level with this, plus or minus a millimeter, which is not very much. And you get this level adjusted by measuring and, and basically just bending the tab on the float. And that tab, when the fuel comes in and the float comes up, it pushes up on the needle, which keeps the gas from flowing into the bowl. So do that on both of these, and hopefully that fixes that issue of us not being able to get enough fuel to start. Here you can see me pushing with my ruler on the float until about where the needle would stop the fuel in the seat, and then adjusting the small tab a little bit at a time to slowly bring the fuel level up to about where it's supposed to be. All right, I got the plugs out. I think everything's back together how it should be. Dumped a bunch of, made sure it took a bunch of fuel. Uh, so we're gonna turn it over, and I might have flooded it when I was forcing a bunch of fuel into it. So I'm gonna turn it over, get the plugs out, and we'll just see if everything still seems to function. Fuel vapor out. So I think we fixed the fuel problem. All right, I got everything together. Give it a little choke. Let's see if she wants to start and run.
Well, there you go. She runs. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Blurry hell yeah. So, all right, it runs. I'm feeling really good about this project. I'm settled into a shop that is way nicer than my old garage. Motivation is high, but the list to finish this thing is a lot. In the next video, I'm gonna try to machine a custom stem to permanently mount this front end. They're currently kind of sketchy mounted with a piece that I temporarily made. I'm also gonna build the rear subframe and get this thing looking like a motorcycle again. But I've also gotta do wiring, exhaust, and do the handlebar switches, the throttle control, brakes, a seat. So there's a lot to do, but it's gonna be a couple more episodes. Hopefully you stick around and watch those. And thanks again for watching.